Good evening. Uh, we're in Ephesians, of course, and we'll be looking at uh, Ephesians 1, 1 through 4. So, I know we've read this before, but you get to read it again with me. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Lord, we just thank you for everything. And we, we do thank you for this inheritance that we have. We thank you for your word. We just pray that you bless us with your presence. Uh, be with Carrie and heal her. Be with Jeanette as she needs healing too. And so does uh, uh, Anna with her back and Steve with his shoulder. And Lord, we just ask that your healing power comes down tonight in a powerful way. Not only physically, but spiritually. And that we'll have a sweet time of fellowship with you. And we just thank you for everything. And we just say this in your name. Amen. Now we're talking about the glorious inheritance. You know... We can't get tired of that. That is a real inspiration to think about our inheritance. And uh, it is a heavenly one, which means we can't even imagine it. It is beyond our imagination. It is not based on something that is temporary, can decay away, or be stolen or lost, like our inheritance on this earth can. The key is how do we possess this inheritance? And I think you have to really realize that yes, it's nice to have a possible inheritance, but how, the key is how do you possess it? And you have to possess this inheritance. Uh, it's not going to, as long as you think you have it, it's, and it and you really don't realize what you have, how can you appreciate it? You really can't. Uh, so, first we have to be identified to that inheritance. You can't just be anybody. People act like, oh, I'm a child of God. Look, uh, if you're not a child of God, you're not identified to that inheritance. Okay, so you have to be identified to that inheritance. And that means being born again. You have to be a born again of the spirit of the water into a new family. I'm here to tell you if you're not part of the family of God. We sing that song. Oh, how we love to sing the song. We're part of the family of God. But are you really part of the family of God? If you have not been born again, you're not part of the family of God. Bottom line. Uh, you're born into the family of God, and people, it's about family relationship. Not according to this world, though. We have some weird ideas about families in this world. You know, my mother uh, was brought up, it's all about family. And she tried to instill that in me. But I remember when I really started following Jesus, he said, what is basically going to be the cost if you follow me. It could be your family. We're talking about an earthly family. But I want you to know he put me in a new family. And it's not that I don't love my earthly family. It's that I realistically know I don't have a lot of agreement with them other than we were born in the same family. Spiritually, a lum are on their own wavelength. Okay? And I don't have a lot of agreement and the more that I am a Christian the less I have a family likeness to them I just have to say that the culture everything that I was brought up in we were all brought up in a certain amount of culture a certain amount of tradition a certain amount of everything and as the Lord began to lead me away he left he led, he led me away from all those things and 
you know, it's like, let the dead bury the dead, the dead traditions, the dead ways, let the dead bury them. If they want to uh, erect altars to them and dance around them, that's their business, but don't you. You are following a new way of living. And so that is a very important thing. When Jesus calls you, he calls you away a lot of times from the family. Now, we need an official seal to designate our right to pursue and claim this inheritance. This is very important. If you don't have the right to pursue it, if you don't have that seal that, you know, truly identifies you, then you can't claim it. There's a lot of people that are pursuing some spiritual inheritance, but the bottom line is when they get there, can they claim it? Can they claim that inheritance? And of course, that seal is the Holy Spirit. If he's not in you, there is no seal. There's no identification. And then we need a will, an official will that spells out what our inheritance is, what the qualification of our inheritance is. Now, I have heard qualifications put on inheritances. Don't kid yourself. We went through one where the, the person had to disassociate with us to get their inheritance. And it was just the way it was. I said, well, you need to do it. It's no big deal. You know, you just need to do it. And then, you know, it's not that you're playing the game. It's that it's no big deal. It's not really taking the stand one way or the other. It's not... Uh, holding a point one way or the other. You're not betraying Christ. You're not betraying your Christianity. You're just, okay, it's just whatever. I'll let the association go. But that was one of the requirements because her family thought we were a cult. People are going to think what they're going to think. So what are the qualifications to receive this inheritance. What's the will say for us to receive it? What is the will? God's word. He tells you right in here how to possess that inheritance. He tells you what's in that inheritance. He tries to give you a reality check about that inheritance in his word. Now the problem is we can squander our inheritance. You know, people have a tendency to spend their inheritance, this is true, before they even receive it, thinking, you know, thinking they will get it in time. I remember um, a story about a guy, he was one of the first guys that was probably affected by these, paras uh, these, um, these um, sprays, you know, for the gardens and so forth and the fields, and he was actually considered brain dead and they went to court took the the people who you know made it they took him to court and won a big settlement he had two children and so they put the money a lot of money in the trust funds for their children until they reached 21 neither children made it there because they lived a very uh, bad lifestyle according to their inheritance did you hear what I said? And one was killed in a car accident and, and one died some other way. Life is ironic that way. You know, and so you can squander your inheritance even in God's kingdom. I want you to think about that for a while. We squander, when we squander the different aspects of God's character and way by hiding behind his love when wanting our own way or cheaping his grace when sinning, we're squandering our inheritance. It's no different. We think we have it. How about claiming mercy, okay, without repentance? God, I want your mercy, but I don't want to repent. Now, how about this one? Conforming without being transformed. Is that going to work for you? 
Here's another one. Operate according to wishful thinking instead of walking by faith and obedience to what is right. That's how you squander your inheritance, your spiritual inheritance. You have to understand that. Now, these people are doing this because they're assuming God will put up with their nonsense. Presuming, okay, that God is somewhat needful and desperate for them when he is neither. Now, it's natural to be attracted to the things of the world, but the only type of inheritance attached to it are the wages of death. That's the only inheritance attached to the world is the wages of death. There is no life. There's no purpose. There's no future in the inheritance that the world can offer you. In fact, a lot of times to possess the inheritance of the world, you have to sell your soul. You have to sell your soul. Now, we may experience something when it comes to the world for a moment, but it's fleeting. It's all fleeting. You can't game the world and inherit heaven. You can't do that. So I've heard of people who knew an inheritance was coming, and they, of course, as I mentioned, live like the devil. In light of that inheritance, when I get rich, you know, I'll pay this off, I'll get this off, and they both, uh, people I know, died. But there's a lot more that that's the story of. We have to be really aware of the fact that we have that seal to that inheritance. We have to avoid squandering it, taking it for granted, assuming, presuming things about it, and possess it. And the way we do that is by faith, according to what the Word of God says. Now, life is ironic, okay? There's no guarantees outside of God. Being in His will or walking according to His Word that we're going to possess this inheritance. Now, the truth is that we can only be assured of an inheritance when we finally receive it in its fullness. That's when you're going to be sure. This is my inheritance. We, are, we have diff, different benefits because of the seal of that inheritance. But you know what? We don't have the total inheritance yet. We have not fully inherited. And people are just banking on all this future possibility. Now, this brings us to how to possess this inheritance. We know it was God's plan before the foundation of the world that we have it. He knew how to uh, get it for us through his son. He knew how, what to give us in order to identify us to it, to seal us to it. It was within his heart and plan to do it. Now, his plan is simple. It was redemption. It was redemption. And it's... Uh, and he chose, you have to understand, he chose each of us before the foundation of the world to partake of this inheritance. Now, how could he choose us? Well, we talked about it. Because he foreknew us. He foreknew who we were, what we were going to do, and whether we were going to be saved or not. He knew it. He knew it. And he knew the condition of our heart. He knew the decisions that we would make. He knew the commitment that we would have. He knew that before the foundation of the world. He saw you here today. He saw me here tonight. He saw it all. That's how he ensured and prepared that inheritance for us. Now, we uh, have to choose it, okay? That's the key. Uh, Yes, he put it in our hearts, such things. 
He put it in your heart I, to be drawn to him. And that's the reality. And we know that. Uh, he also put that faith in us, that measure of faith to embrace it, okay? Uh, but you and I have to choose it. We have to choose that inheritance for ourselves. We have to choose to possess it. He can't step over our will. We have to choose it. Yes. And we possess it by faith because we believe what, who he is. We believe his word. We obey it. We follow after him. That's the bottom line of this inheritance, how to possess it. Now, the problem is that in our intelligence, we can rationalize away this whole concept of trusting God with everything, trusting him to bring us into that inheritance. We can rationalize it away. And any time you try to understand and comprehend the things of God and put it into your uh, little religious understanding, you are going to enter into unbelief. Because it's not going to make sense to your mind. You have to, by faith, believe it, no matter what. Do I believe I have an inheritance? You bet. I don't need to see it all. I don't need whatever. I just believe it. Now I'm in the process of walking towards it. I am being, trying to be faithful to God, who's been faithful to me. I am trying to be obedient. I'm trying to be sensitive. Yes, along the way I'm human, and I blow it, and all those things. But I come back into line with my inheritance. Because I believe it's there. I believe I have some of it now. But I believe there's a greater measure waiting for me in that inheritance. Now I'm going to tell you something right now. My inheritance is the person of Christ. I have him in my heart. I have him in my life. I have seen glimpses of his glory. But when I gain that full reality of his glory, that's when I'm going to really realize I have the fullness of my inheritance. But not until then. Not until then. Now, we need to note something, okay? We need to note that because of what we would do by choosing him, he knew he would choose uh, him, he chose us first. It has to be that way. The shepherd has to look for the lost sheep. It has to be that way. And so he knew who would ultimately choose him, and so he chose them first. So are you glad he chose you? Well, if you have the seal of the Holy Spirit, he's chose you. If you've been born again, he's chose you to what? Obtain this inheritance, which has a lot in it. Now, Paul wanted us to understand all of this, okay? Uh, we have to stay away from being sentimental about it. And I think that's what people get. Oh, yeah, I'm... I'm part of the family of God and I've got this wonderful inheritance. There's nothing sentimental about what's going on here. It takes sobriety. It takes faith. It takes obedience. It takes walking out this life that is, you're, you're being called to holiness. You're being called to walk blameless before God in your conduct. That is all serious business. That's part of the requirements of being able to receive the inheritance. Now, let me tell you about your walk a little bit. He's preparing you to receive the inheritance. If he doesn't prepare you to receive the inheritance, it will turn around and judge you and destroy you. That's what our inheritance will do if we're not prepared for it. And we have to realize that. Because it's... Who is attached to? God. Okay? It's attached to heaven. It's attached to everything that's holy. Now, we have been chosen to be holy. That's what it comes down to. Uh, you've been called, yes, but you're chosen to be holy. 
That's why many are called and few are chosen. Because they do not choose the way of holiness. They don't choose the way of holiness. Uh, yeah, I'm called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they don't choose holiness. And that is, the holiness is a state. And that state comes out of repentance, usually out of brokenness. Now, one of the things that I've learned a long time ago, you can be broken by your sin here. But until you're broken by what your sin costs God, you really have no idea. You have no idea of the brokenness that needs to take place. One, another way that you're broken is when you really finally do get a glimpse of God's holiness, you're like Isaiah, I'm undone and I'm in trouble. And when you're at that state, you're broken. You, you can't even say, Lord, I can't even speak because I am of perverse lips. And the Lord says, okay, angel, take that coal and put it to his lips. You know, we really don't have that concept of how far away we are from God, how much he had to come down until we see him in his holiness and it breaks us because we are just as useless, worthless as we can be. Our best is filthy rags. I've seen that. I knew at that time I deserved hell. And if he sent me to hell, he'd have every right to. That's when his grace became more precious to me. That's when I began to understand mercy better. You see, I needed him because of my sin. But when I was broken, I was desperate for him because I was pathetic and I couldn't change my situation. So it comes from great brokenness. And so when David says, do whatever you have to with me, God, put that searchlight on me, whatever you have to do, I say, God, whatever you have to do, if you have to break me into a million pieces, do. Because in the end, I want to finish the course. I want to possess the inheritance totally, completely that you have for me. Holiness comes out, oftentimes holy state comes out of true repentance and brokenness before God. We begin to realize in that humble state, I can't do it, but God is able to do it to me, through me, and it's all about walking it out by faith. And in that faith is obedience. And in that faith comes godliness. And in that godliness comes holy conduct that sets me apart. So Paul is being very honest here as I said for holy for God speaks of his transparency that can consume but for us it is being set apart by our conduct our attitude the way we respond to things we are part we are set apart individually as a saint okay collectively as a royal priesthood and together as a holy nation or kingdom, a peculiar special people, which we talked about today, this morning, and of course that's in 1 Peter 2.9. We have been called to this type of life, not because we are able, okay, to in our own strength be holy, but because of his love that is shed abroad in our hearts. You know, everything I do is out of love. And people, when you have the love of God, there is nothing purer than the love of God. See, God is love. He can do nothing but respond out of love for you and I. He gave his only begotten son out of love for you and I. We have that, we should have that same pure love flowing through us. Do we like people all the time? No. But when we decide, God, you love them, give me what I need, he'll give you that love. He'll give you that burden. He'll give you that strength to see something through. 
I've seen it time and time in my own life. All I needed to do was be willing to be obedient. To trust and obey. How many times have we sang that song? Trust and obey. It comes down to that. Okay, the heart desire must be there, of course, before the determination can be established. So God puts a desire in our heart if we're willing to listen to it. But then we have to determine it so to be established in that. Without determination, people, determination is commitment, whatever. Without that, the authority and power to endure to the end will not be there for you. Won't be there. People say, I don't know why I can't finish the course. I have such zeal. I have such this. It was all about you. Become that nothing in the scheme of things, and God can use you. Okay? Get yourself out of the way and know it has to be from God. We obey his commandments because we love him. Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. We turn the other cheek. We go the extra mile, all for his sake, not our sake. If you're doing it for your sake, you're not even going to go across the street for that person, okay? It's just that simple. We do it for his glory because his love is eternal, never-ending, and motivating us. So is love enough? Well, we know he's love. There's nothing he... He can do outside of that love, but that love is holy because it's pure, it's transparent, and it's true. Therefore, it's righteous and honorable. And outside of his love, we will be nothing but rigid, self-righteous. Oh, I love that one. Self-righteous prunes or prudes. That's all we are. Stoic, my way, no love. You see, that is what much of our religion is today in our churches. Nothing personal. It lacks love. And you know what that tells me right there? If the love of God is not in you and present, something's wrong. You're either not saved or you're in rebellion. Or you have put God in some terrible religious box. Jesus said very clear, very purely and, cl and very clear, if they will know you are my disciples because you have love for one another, how much have we been told that and how much have you seen that? There's not going to be any excuse because it's all there in Scripture. You either believe it or you don't. Now, the first thing we have to note, let's look at verse 5, because there's some things that are very important here. Verse 5 in Ephesians 1 says, Having predestinated us, notice that, this is a loaded scripture, they're very loaded in Ephesians. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of of his will. I want you to take that and if you really study it, you're going to only be able to take a little bite side, uh, bite, bites out of it because it is major. There is so much in this scripture. I think you could spend a long time on it. We're not going to, but you could. So the first thing I want you to look up, having predestinated. Okay, we get into all this predestination, don't we? But the first thing you have to know about it is he's talking to the saved. The saved have been predestinated. People have it backwards. They think because you're predestinated, you're saved. No, if you're saved, you're predestinated. There's a big difference. Predestination doesn't apply to someone who doesn't know Christ out there. 
They're not even part of the plan. You have to be redeemed to be part of the plan before you can even claim predestination. He's talking to the saved. He's talking to the church. You, because you're saved, have been predestinated. For what? For what? Now, predestination... You have to realize it's something that you are to fulfill. In other words, it has purpose. It has a pattern. It has a fulfillment to it. What have you been predestinated for? Do your own thing? Live your own life? You have to ask yourself that. So I'm predestinated unto what? Well, it says so unto the adoption of children. You've been predestinated to be adopted. How important is adoption? Now I'll tell you something. I, uh, when I was growing up, my parents took in kids. You call them foster children, whatever you want to call them. Some were, were there just only a couple of months. But some were there, one was there for about four years, one was there for a year. That one was my foster sister. She lives in Coeur d'Alene right now. I want you to know she's more family to me than my, some of my family is. We're not related. No, we're not related, but we have this care for one another. This Commitment to one another. And, of course, she's a Christian, which really helps. Okay? That really is a big uh, plus. But this is talking about adoption. We have been fulfilled. We have been predestinated to fulfill a certain purpose in his kingdom. I'm going to tell you what that purpose is. Want to know what it is? To take on his family likeness. Think about what I'm saying. We've been adopted to take on his family likeness. That's what the predestination is all about. He makes us part of the family so we can take on the family likeness. Turn with me to Romans 8, 29. We studied this, but let's go back there. It says, for whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. In other words, take on family likeness that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's Romans 8.29. We have been predestinated to take on family likeness. But how are you going to take on family likeness unless you are being constantly exposed to it. My stepfather raised me, and it was amazing what some people said. I thought he was really your father. You look like him and you act like him. You have to understand that which influences you the most. I want you to know I didn't look like my stepfather at all, but I probably acted like him a few times. Doesn't matter, okay, who you're born to, if you allow that to influence you the most, you're going to take on that likeness. So if I want to take on the likeness of Christ, I have to be exposed to him. I have been given that avenue through being adopted into the family. Now, what does that mean to be adopted into the family? Again, we come back to some people believe predestination has to do with salvation. No, it has to do with saints of God fulfilling their ordained calling and purpose in the kingdom of God. Our commission is the same, but our calling is different. However, in the end, it will fulfill the same purpose. And, of course, that is to take on the family likeness or the image of Christ. 
It's that simple. Not easily accomplished. I just have to say that. Paul has told us what we have been predestinated according to our inheritance and that our adoption into the heavenly family. We have been adopted into the heavenly family. I'm here to tell you without that adoption, there's no inheritance. You have no right to that inheritance outside that adoption. That's what people don't understand. Oh, we're all children of God. No, we're not. If you're not adopted into the family of God, you're not a child of God. And that's what Paul is trying to get through to us in a way. There's much about this adoption we need to understand, okay? And we can go to Romans 8, 14 through 17, and look at that. And it says a lot. In fact, you'll see this idea or this concept of adoption also being mentioned in Galatians. Let me get the Romans here. Talking too much. Can't imagine that, right? Uh, we're going to start, of course, as I said, in 14, verse 14. For as many as are led by... The, now, here's another qualification. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We have to be led by the Spirit if we're going to truly be children of God. For if you have not received the spirit of bondage again, the spirit of bondage is this world. You were born under that spirit of bondage. You were in bondage until you received Christ as your Lord and Savior. So that he goes on to say, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Fear what? Fear death. Fear all those different things that we feared, especially facing a holy God. But you have received what? The spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. This is the real witness in us. The spirit of God says, yes, you're a child of God because you have been born again. You're in the family and yes, you may be blowing it here and there, but you're still part of the family. And then he goes on to say, and if children, here we go, if you're really a child of God, then you're heirs, heirs of God. You're his heir. And joint heirs with Christ. You're joint heir with, with Christ who has been given all of the abundance of heaven itself and the promises are in him. And it goes, if so, he that we, if so, that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. There's a lot there. If we are led by the right spirit, we are assured that we are no longer going to come under the spirit of bondage. If you're in bondage, why are you there? If you've been born again. You're not letting God have his way in some area of your life. Maybe there's something you're harboring in your life that would be sin or unacceptable to God. Let him put the line on it. You don't have to live in bondage. He came to set you free. That's part of the inheritance we have. It's working now. It will be totally realized in heaven. Aren't you glad? I am. Now, it says, uh, of course, we have to have the Holy Spirit. And if we have the Holy Spirit, we have the assurance of being able to have that relationship with the Father. What a powerful, beautiful relationship that is. But you know what? Many people had bad fathers. They don't even know what it means to have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. And they look at that and they're in bondage because they can't appreciate or enjoy that relationship with the Father. It's a tragedy. A lot of people are, are suffering from that. Now, we have been heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. We feel that. 
the question is, why do we feel rejected if, like an orphan if we've truly been born again and are part of the family of God? Why do we act like orphans? That we don't belong. That we're not accepted. That we're missing something. I'm not an orphan, are you? I want you to know if you're not born again, you are an orphan. You better flee to God. It says I need some water. Okay. So as we go on here, the one thing I want you to know, uh, Galatians 4, 3 through 7 talks about this adoption as well, as I said, it's in Galatians 2. Let's go to that really quickly. I just went past Galatians. Okay, 4. We're going to look at 3 through 7. It says, even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, meaning Christ, God sent forth his son, made of woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. Notice where it has to be, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. If a son, then an heir of God through Christ. With powerful words. How much time have you spent on studying the adoption? Your adoption. To really understand what you have in Christ. Paul puts his finger on it in more than one scripture. So do you think it's important to understand? I think so. We were not under the bondage of the law anymore. We're going to get into that a little bit more down the line. We're not open to the temptations of this world the attractions and the claims of it anymore. We are no longer part of that, that world, that system, that kingdom. We are now part of an adopted, we're adopted and we're part of a new family, a new way of living to become a child of God. Are you living that new way? You can't be an heir unless you have been officially adopted. Now, I didn't know this until I studied this. I've shared this many times, but it always, it always humbles me. <clears throat> but in, in the um, Roman days, when Jesus lived and Paul lived, every child that was born was born in the status of a slave. Every child. It didn't matter how big the household was. Every child was born under the status of a slave. That's what we are. Born under the status of a slave. What they had to do is whoever was uh, designated to be the heir, a son, for instance. In fact, if you watch Ben-Hur, this is what happened in that show. Watch it. That's exactly what happened. They were, they were showing the Roman law at that time. Because this commander said to Ben Hur, he says, I will adopt you. I will make you an heir. What they had to do was take that heir to the court, the son, who was a slave, had to take him to the court, and they had to adopt him before he could be an heir. Now, that is how they did it in the Roman court. We have a different adoption thing. We have a tendency to put that there. No, this was actually a son in that household. He still had to go through the adoption to be the heir. 
because they were all born in the status of a slave. So what does this mean for you and I? We have been taken to an official court of heaven and because of the Holy Spirit, we have been adopted so we can be heirs. Because unless you had that adoption in the Roman time, you could not be an heir. So we didn't know this, but Paul knew that when he was talking about it. And everybody of that day knew what he was talking about. Now, if you're adopted, you're no longer under bondage. Rather, you are freely called out from the very heart of the Father in heaven. If you're a child of God, you're no longer a servant to terrible slave masters, but an heir of God through Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.29 says, And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You are heirs according to the promise that has been secured in Christ. We are Abraham's seed because of faith. We're not biological seed, we're a spiritual seed of faith. Galatians 3.14 says, And we are heirs according to the promise of God. Now look at Titus 3.7. I'm going to keep you a little busy here. But Titus 3.7. Titus 3.7 says, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We have been made heirs to the, co to the hope of eternal life. That's Titus 3, 7. What incredible promises we have as adopted children in the kingdom of God. We have incredible ongoing promises. We have been justified by his grace, people. How much more can we ask for? Hebrews 1.14, it says, Are they not the ministering angels sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? We have ministering angels around us because we're heirs of salvation. We have, we're heirs to hope. We're heirs to salvation. We're heirs to promises. We're heirs because we've been adopted. Yet, how much do we live like we have no hope? How about Hebrews 6, 17? If you're there. Wherein God willingly more abundantly to show unto you heirs of promise the immutable ability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. So in that promise is his tremendous Wisdom, his tremendous unchanging character that will not take back what he has promised you. Now we have been adopted by Jesus Christ to himself. I want you to think about that. He didn't adopt you so you could be a wayward, rebellious child or so you can continue to live like an orphan or like you don't belong anywhere. He did it for himself. He adopted you to himself. Think about that for a minute. He adopted you to himself. How are you living? What's your relationship with him? How close are you to him? We belong to him. We're heirs with him. Okay? But you have to notice the last part of Ephesians. You have to go back to Ephesians 1 5. I'm going to keep you busy there. You have to notice the last part of it. Because if you miss it, you're not going to get it very well. Having predestinated us, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. 
He's Lord. He's owner. Okay. According to what? Your good pleasure? No. His good pleasure. In light of what? His will. It's his good pleasure. His will. Not yours. How do we communicate that? Well, we need to. I ask the question, how many think God is here to make their life pleasurable? I'll just quote a scripture to him. I'll twist his arm. Because he's here for my pleasure, my bidding. That's not what my Bible says. How many are here to get their will done? Let's manipulate God here and there with methods, words, and what is considered rights and clever presentations. Surely God will note those things. I want you to know what Jesus did on our behalf was because of redemption. Redemption, he redeemed us for the purpose of adoption. Adoption for his pleasure, according to his will. Now, if Jesus is delighted, is the Father delighted too? What delights the Father's heart? It's the same thing that delights the son. What delights the father's heart? Those very simple. We'll get into that more. That his son be glorified in your life. That's what will delight the father. That you take on his son's likeness. Will glorify the father. That's why we're here. I want you to rely something. I want you to consider Luke 12:32 with me for a minute. Luke 12:32. As you can see, the scripture isn't is very loaded. As I said, 12:32. It says, "Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the." kingdom don't fear one of his good pleasures is that he gives you his kingdom but will you receive it will you walk it out will you possess that what about uh, 2 Thessalonians 1.11 if you can get over there we'll look at that It says in 2 Thessalonians 1.11, it says, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. See, he wants to show his goodness to you. He wants to entrust you with faith that has power. That's what he wants to do. That would bring him pleasure if he could do that through your life. Of course, you can't please God without faith. Okay, oh, how the Father takes pleasure when the Son is glorified to, through those who have been adopted. Psalms 15, 11 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence, in the fullness of joy at thy right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. At the right hand of God is the Son what it's talking about. In him are pleasures forevermore. So in Christ we can know real pleasure. Through Christ we can experience real pleasure. And because of Christ the Father will take pleasure in what is brought forth in our lives for his son's glory. So look at 6. We're not going to get in Ephesians 1, 6 a whole lot because that's another sermon, okay? I'm just going to let you know that. 
But let's look at Ephesians 1 6. We get there. It says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. There's so many people running around wanting to be accepted. And yet in Christ, we are accepted in the beloved. Now that's something that should bring praise. And it's because of his grace. Nothing else. To me, this is one of the most liberating scriptures to me. The praise of the glory of his grace. It should set my spirit free. It should set my soul above this world. What he has given us shall bring, shall bring praise to a grateful heart because it comes through heavenly glory. You see, Christ in you is a hope of glory. The glory of heaven came down took on humanity so he could touch man so he could become the Lamb of God. That glory should be shining through us as we take on his family likeness because that's what we've been predestinated for. To be adopted, to go through that process of adoption which is like that. And then begin to discover our inheritance. Now all this glory is attached to grace. Grace that abounds. Grace that freely gives. Grace that is available. Grace that enriches our lives. It is this grace that makes us acceptab acceptable or accepted in the beloved. It has been bestowed on us through the Son's life. Through his mercy, God's mercy, and his incredible blessings and promises. It is always a matter of grace, people. But how many of us miss the opportunity to praise him for his abundant gifts that have been wrapped up by grace and freely offered to each of us so we can partake of them as heirs of salvation. 